So if you remember this case, uh, and multiple areas of full thickness fissures. So, uh, oops. and here at this, you can also see cartilage, believe it or not, on low field scanners. It's a 0 0.2 Tesla scanner, and we can see some uh, signal abnormality within the cartilage. Okay, Tayson, what do you think of this case? All right, 48 year old, six months, known medial meniscal tear. Um, well, the anterior compartment cartilage doesn't look too okay. bad. So um, there's a... This is the three skip point five. Here are cube images. And I want you to look right in this area. And if we go through these and the cube with these thinner cuts. Yeah, it looks like. You see a lot of it. There's actually trochlear disease. And this is that same location on the thicker cuts. Yeah. So uh, uh, it's one of the reasons why it's important to look at the cartilage on our standard imaging on all three planes. You guys have already probably seen cases where you haven't been able to see a lesion on the sagittals, but on the coronals you can see it or vice versa. Because uh, with these thick cuts and skipping, you can uh, partial volume away uh, some pathology since we don't routinely use these uh, thinner cut images. So just be aware of that. And a common location is right here in the central trochlea, uh, which right in through there. Uh, sagittal images can be helpful. These are our standard ones. You can clearly see that they're sitting there. Maybe a little very small uh, subchondral osteophyte there. If we go to the thinner cuts, you can see the subchondral osteophyte better and actually see the margins of the full thickness defect, grade four defect better as well. So I really think that these 3D thin cut images uh, with no skip are really better for cartilage. Uh, but uh, again, you know, if you just have one or two scanners and they all have the same software and so forth, you can really fine tune your, your protocols. I think it's important if you're in a large organization to standardize your protocols. I've seen a number of disasters that can occur if the protocols aren't standard. And I've uh, uh, been expert witnesses on a number of malpractice cases that were basically uh, disasters that occurred because protocols weren't standard. And when they brought people back to follow them over time, they kept changing the protocols and you couldn't follow them. And I think if we get into the tumor section at the end of the year, I'll show some cases where uh, disease could progress for a couple of years before it was recognized because uh, each of the protocols were different. So it's important to standardize uh, what you do. In a large institution like this, with a lot of our scanners who can't do the, th the, the special protocols using kind of a standard protocol, uh, often works out uh, yeah, better. All right, so we have two sagittals, rule out meniscal tear. Uh, we have a T2 and a cube, and it looks like there's at least some moderate grade chondromalacia posterior. Yeah, here you can clearly see it's grade four with fluid going all the way to the bone. Here it's a little bit harder to see, but again, you can see how the thinner, thinner cups give you much better kind of contrasted margins uh, in these. Uh, so if you're dealing with someone who really does likes to do, uh, really wants to know the accurate size, as I said before, most of the literature shows that MR underestimates the size of the lesion. I think that's often because radiologists don't quite understand what the orthopedic surgeon really wants the lesion, how how they how the orthopedic surgeon needs it to be measured. But uh, again, uh, the thinner cuts allow you more precise measurement if, if that's important. Okay, next case. Okay, so here, looking at the, I think that's going to be the lateral trochlea. I see cartilage loss and subchondral cysts. Yeah. 
you know, central, you know, lateral trochlear. This is actually on the front test of system. So you can really say that there's a lot of chronic disease here. These subchondral cysts are chronic, sharp margins. There's probably some acute on top of this, which is more the edema we see out here with indistinct margins, which is more an acute injury in this particular patient. Here we don't really see a full thickness defect within the articular cartilage in this particular patient in these images. On the axials, there's a lot more regularity of that bone suggesting full thickness defect. And here, uh, again, we can see this. Now, what does this look like at arthroscopy? At arthroscopy, this is what it really looked like. This is all kind of crab meat here. Uh, uh, very degenerated, loose, uh, unstable uh, articular cartilage with full thickness defects going back into here. Uh, you can see this. And then to treat it, you have to debreed it, which we talked about before. So this is what it looks like after debreeding. And, and this is the size you want to know to determine what kind of a technique you're going to do to, to treat this. So you can see here, and I don't know, you know, we can make a, make a given measurement here, try to determine what the extent is. Here you can see it looks like it's a maybe a relatively small full thickness defect, but when you debride it back to stable cartilage, it's actually a much bigger lesion. So coming back to the MR, really you'd have to measure from this edge of the lesion all the way out to here to get an accurate determination of what the size of that lesion is going to be after you debreed it. In my experience, it's always larger than you anticipate. Mm. Yeah. Okay, and here's just another case where we can see on a lower field scanner of full thickness defects, a grade four chondromalacia. Chronic, chronic grade four chondromalacia here on both sides of the patella. Here we can see multiple areas of deep fissuring, not all of which are probably grade four, but this probably is a grade four coming in here. Uh, How would you measure that? Yeah, so that, so this would be difficult. On a, situations like this, you know, you, you'd really need to talk to the orthopedic surgeon and kind of determine and describe it. I would just basically describe these as being full thickness defects. This lesion, if you're going to debreed all the unstable components, is probably going to go from here to here. Over here, this these are deep fissures, uh, but but again, I uh, I'm not sure that you would debreed all of this uh, in in this particular case. So you just have to describe these as being deep fissures, probably grade three chondromalacia probably a grade four coming in here, and you could probably measure this size from here to here. And the PD fat set, we can see a nice intact cartilage here. Uh, and another patient here, we can, this is actually another location farther down in this patient, and we can see there's extensive grade four when we get to the area of abnormality with subchondral bone edema. So well, let's then talk a little bit about what does all this means. This is an article that came out in 2019, which kind of surprised me. And the question, Tayson, is can marathon running improve knee damage of middle-aged adults? And this was a prospective cohort study, which, which they did, published in the British Medical Journal. Since you were surprised, I'm going to say it improved. Well, I wouldn't have said that back then. <laughs> so they had 82 healthy adults. And they... Uh, they had an MR six months before their first marathon was scheduled. 71 com uh, of them completed four months of training, and they completed the mar marathon. And they repeated the MR scan two weeks uh, after they ran the marathon. What they found was that significant improvement occurred in the subchondral bone edema. So much to what I would have gathered uh, uh, many of the, actually most of these patients, middle-aged adults, actually had areas of subchondral bone edema and cystic changes in the, uh, uh, in the uh, subchondral bone, and all of them had less subchondral edema after running the marathon than they did when they started the study. Uh, again, trying to figure this out, I have to realize that not using your knee not using that cartilage is actually not good for the cartilage. 
Uh, uh, now, what they did find, however, they had increased cartilage loss to the lateral patellar cartilage, and uh, they had increased signal in the semimembranosus tendon, iliotibia band, and prepatellar bursa. Uh, there was no change in the menisci. Uh, all of the patients had significantly decreased knee pain after running the marathon. So I, you know, this is to me surprising. Uh, the loss of the patella cartilage, which they saw, was not symptomatic. No increase in knee symptoms were found in anyone, and the vast majority were significantly improved. So their results was that long-distance running can improve osteoarthritis in middle-aged people who have osteoarthritis. So I guess it's the old use it or lose it sort of thing. So what MRI changes occur at articular cartilage after marathon running? This is another study. This is in skeletal radiology, where they actually looked at the signal changes in articular cartilages before and after running. Uh, I'm assuming immediately or soon after the running, uh, there'd be edema or increased signal within the cartilage. And... Okay. So after running, the volume and water content of the cartilage actually decreases. Uh, then it normalizes about 10 to 48 hours. When they looked at T1 road changes, they were variable, uh, but primarily decreased after running and then was increased at, at 48 hours. Remember, T1 row is kind of a measure of the proteoglycan content uh, within the articular cartilage. Uh, so, now are these are these people uh, normal to begin with? The, these were this group, I think, were normal, right? These were not the middle-aged people with degenerative knees like the previous one. These are young, normal adults, runners. And, and most of these were not their first marathon. These were actual running athletes. So it just shows that after you do a marathon, you actually decrease the volume and the water content of the cartilage. You squish out a lot of the cartilage. Then what happens is the cartilage then absorbs a lot of the water and actually becomes a little bit of edematous at 48 hours and presumably it normalizes after that. But this is probably what is good for the cartilage by using it, by squeezing the water out, letting other fluid come in, you're actually pumping those nutrients into the articular cartilage and it's prob that's probably the reasons why it's good and the reason why you, the T1 row actually shows that, uh, that, it, that it increases probably because you're getting nutrients and getting a, a proteoglycan production by the, the chondrocytes. So let's look a little bit now at acute injuries to the articular cartilage. You can get a number of different kinds of injuries. You can get delamination, flap tears, get a full thickness defect, and uh, injury also not only the cartilage but the bone. And as we talked about before, you can actually get injury to the bone and not the cartilage as well with acute injuries. So here's the case where you see a full thickness fissure in the articular cartilage. And here we can see that that fluid undermines the articular cartilage, so now you have a separation which typically goes through the calcified layer of the cartilage, where the cartilage is separated from the underlying bone. And in this case, you can actually see that it's actually, uh, the cartilage sometimes will stretch, and uh, uh, you'll, you'll really have a separation between the cartilage and the bone. That sometimes can make it very difficult to get these to, to, to uh, adhese back together again. Uh, and this is we typically call a demolamination injury. People have tried tacking these down and hoping that works. Uh, often that doesn't, and you basically have to go in and put in a graft. John, do you want to comment on this? Well, this, um, uh, this is a trial, so uh, chances are that you can probably put the cartilage back in of where it belongs, and uh, um, I used to use nails, um, and and now they have tiny screws that they can use, uh -huh. and uh, 
track it down um, and, and and maybe get away with it. Uh, the, the, the main thing I think there's a, a, a lot of orthopedic surgeons like to get the people um, active too quickly. I, I think they should immobilize a little longer than they they put in the books. Okay. That, that's just my opinion, not, not anything that I wrote about. Wait, who's next? Okay, so looking at the patellar cartilage on the the PD fat set image on the right, looks like there's separation of the cartilage from the bone. So like a delamination maybe. Um, yeah, edema in the, uh, is it the lateral femoral condyle, maybe from a patellar dislocation? So, yeah. So this was a transient patellar dislocation, and it's relatively common to get injuries to the articular cartilage with patellar dislocations. And there, these are glancing blows, and that will tend to uh, produce these delamination-type injuries. So whenever you see this uh, uh, evidence of edema within the subcortical bone of the anterior aspect of the lateral femoral condyle, typically where you get impaction from the patella with a transient dislocation. You have to look carefully at the bone of the patella, and you have to look carefully at the articular cartilage. You have to look for loose bodies also. Yes. That's, that's important. Yeah, loose bodies and obviously the medial patella from a ligament and so forth. All right, 13-year-old male injured playing basketball um, at the medial trochlea uh, extending to central there's a large area of uh, cartilage loss and i think it's displaced uh, inferiorly right. it's, uh, anterior to the so so that's the other thing you have to look for if you see a big defect in the cartilage like this with sharp margins the underlying bone looks pretty normal so this is very typical of an acute injury and then you have to look for the displaced fragment here. And you're right, that's the displaced fragment right there. And here are the coronal images. We can see some bone edema, you know, that subcounter bone in the area where the impaction occurred and the displaced cartilage here. John? Yeah, you, you want to uh, save that uh, at the time of surgery and put it back in place and and hope for the best. Okay. Uh, with it, uh, 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 instruments that we have uh, today uh, and absorbable screws, um, these can be repaired. Um, like I said, just just be patient with uh, activity. Thank you. All right, so we have an axial of the knee. Uh, looks like there's some a small corporal thickness fissure of that lateral patellar facet. Some dysplastic trochlear. Yeah, yeah, probably a shallow trochlear groove, right? Mm -hmm. So that's a curl, a cute cartilage tear. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um... So that's a T1 rated sagittal image. Okay. And this is the reason why we don't do T1 sagittal images uh, really anymore. Here's what the PD fats have looked like. Okay, so there's a uh, cartilage defect along the weight-bearing surface of the, of the femur there. So here, so we can see a flap tear here. Okay. A little flap sitting there, so this is all unstable. Mm -hmm. And again, if you tried to measure this, you obviously you have to measure from there over to there, because they're, they're presumably, if they're going to go in and, and do something like a graft or something, they're going to remove this unstable part of the meniscus. Now, as John was saying, in a kid, they might want to preserve it, but in adults, that doesn't work very well. So I uh, usually have to remove the unstable fragment, as we've been talking about. Okay. One test of study. All right, acute injury. 
This is a, a, some T1 weighted images. It's T1. It's Looks pretty, pretty good. Here's the stir. Okay, it's well, there's good. a uh, focal, full thickness, chondral defect, weight bearing, lateral condyle. Yeah. Now, these are usually longer AP diameter than they are wide. Okay. So, you know, you have to measure both. And then here. Yeah, it looks like there's some delamination more right. posteriorly as well. Delamination, right. So, uh, yeah. And then, yeah, and it, it, usually these are much longer in the sagittal dimension. And here's just another example of a full thickness defect, relatively acute defect. In this case, there's really no underlying bone edema. Okay. All right, so we have MCP pain after injury. It's like there may be a full thickness fissure there. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's something that looks pretty subtle right there. Yeah. Really hard to see much going on here. Yeah. So, but this patient went to arthroscopy, and this is what they found at arthroscopy. This was a kind of an unstable defect, and when they peeled it up, there was a big defect there. When they deep it, it actually was a fairly large lesion. So th this is one which was uh, significantly uh, uh, under-visualized on the MR examination. And this was an acute flap tear. Do you know what they did for it? Uh, I don't know, John. Okay. This is uh, from Australia. That's a tiny joint, so. So. Um, here we see full thickness defect, cartilage defect along the patella. So another one. And so in a case like this, it looks nice and sharp. So you really want to look around to find the unstable fragment. And here's another case where we have, this is a kind of acute on top of chronic. See there are a lot of chronic changes here. And here we can see the unstable fragment in situ here, some already some degenerative change there. And then you have to look around, and here is not only was there a loose fragment in the area of the defect, but we can see there's a displaced uh, loose fragment here that you have to look for. Another other example of another acute uh, displaced uh, cartilage lesion with uh, uh, just look. Uh, loose body in this patient who had another transient patellar dislocation. And then often we'll see these years after they occur, and it's again quite commonly in the area of the defect over time, and it's usually in a matter of months. Uh, you can see uh, subchondral osteophytes developed as the body's attempting to heal it. Here we can see the subchondral osteophyte. Over here we can see the displaced a fragment of articular cartilage. Some people like to do MR arthrography. I really don't think it's necessary. I don't recommend doing it, but with MR arthrography, you can also see these defects. And the only thing is you can see them well on a T1 weighted image, where you can't before, but we see them very well now with high quality T2 and PD fat side images. So I don't think contrast is really very helpful. If you go in the shoulder, often these cartilage defects can be very subtle. Here you can see the articular cartilage there. It terminates there, and this was a full thickness cartilage defect uh, in, the, in the humeral head. And in the Abra view, it's this area right in through here. Now uh, this MR arthrogram. Uh, so the cartilage is thinner there. And we don't need to look at this. And again, more of a chronic type injury defect. We, we can see some irritation of this underlying bone from the injury. And again, these are the typical chronic changes that you've all seen that we really don't need to, to go through here. And we've already talked about subchondral osteophytes, which develop over time as the bone tries to grow out and 
and heal the defect. Uh, this was in a professional rugby player. Here we can see this acute defect. Uh, this is on 10.7. Over a year later, we can see the subchondral osteophyte developing in that location. Again, here, this, this person likes to make bone, and we can see the subchondral osteophyte. And then we can also see the interval increase in the marginal osteophytes in this patient over this more than a year time frame. <laughs> Is the articular cartilage intact over the subchondral osteophyte? Um, I I don't think so. Uh, it I think it's yeah it's definitely overestimated on the PD in comparison to the T two. So again, you know, uh, my experience is that if you actually go to thin cut imaging, like we're going to show here in a minute, wherever you see subchondral osteophytes, I don't think I've ever seen. Uh, highland articular cartilage overlying it. Sometimes you can get a little fibrous shape, but uh, I think subchondral osteophytes are a strong indication that you're dealing with grade four uh, full thickness defects. And if we go to the uh, cube thin cut, you can clearly see that it's hard to see here, but on the thinner cut, you can clearly see that the sub there is no highland cartilage overlying the subchondral osteophyte. Okay, so uh, what about treatment of these? Uh, there are a number of things that uh, people have talked about in the literature. There's subchondroplasty, uh, arthroscopic debridement and leaving it debrided. You can pin the, uh, uh, if you could take the fragment of cartilage, put it back in place and pin it in, either with the nails or the screws John was talking about. You can do a microfracture technique and then there are a whole host of different grafts, and then there are actually chondrocyte transplantation techniques. So uh, here's a case where we can see predominantly chronic long-standing grade four chondromalacia. There is full thickness defects of the articular cartilage over large areas in this medial compartment with a subchondral granulation tissue and bone edema here. A lot of irregularity of the subchondral bone. And here we can see on both planes. And uh, see the subchondral edema. Uh, so this was 51818. Now we're we're looking at uh, four months later. And uh, what do you see here? Uh, so it looks like pretty extensive grade four chondromalation. Almost looks like a subchondral fracture. Yeah, yeah, right. So we can see across here mm -hmm. and through there. And this is called a subchondroplasty. Yeah. John, do you want to say anything about these? I, I, I only had one patient like this, but the, the uh, tibial uh, plateau and uh, uh, most of the physis was depressed all the way down um, and, and out of place and just uh, looked like mush. This was before MRIs. And uh, the patient was uh, old enough uh, in the 70s to do a total joint replacement. Okay. Um, we, we could do a unilateral you know, one, but... We yeah. decided to do an entire knee. Yeah. But but uh, these are often to kind of relieve pain by decreasing the pressure through the abnormal bone. Yeah. Uh, usually you see this in osteo uh, um, osteoporotic knees. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so looking at the lateral compartment on the PD fat set, there's full chondral loss, grade four chondromalacia, some subchondral edema. Uh, so this uh, you'll you'll notice also that the meniscus is absent. Yes. Mm -hmm. so, so, surgically. Yeah, unfortunately, I don't have the preoperative study in this patient. 
This is a patient where they actually did a uh, near total meniscectomy and they depleted yeah. the articular cartilage. <clears throat> they basically removed the abnormal articular cartilage. So depleadment <laughs> was a relatively common procedure uh, uh, for quite a number of years. John, do you want to comment on just going in and debreeding? Oh, I, I used to remove a lot of those. Uh, you, you were not allowed to leave the posterior horn. So when you did a meniscectomy, you did an entire meniscectomy. Uh, the main thing was to avoid any abrasion of the articular surface. Um, but that's all we had in those days. And if you left the posterior horn in, in place, a lot of these people would have a lot of pain after surgery and clicking and giving way, et cetera. And you got sued. Fortunately for me, I never left one behind and never got sued. Yeah. So what happened to the patients down the road? I used to see the patients a year afterwards and uh, I don't remember anybody really giving me a hard time about anything. Yeah. Yeah, but now they've been that, that includes that athletic people. Yeah. Now the number of studies that have come out saying by debreeding the articular cartilage, the actually articul even if it's abnormal articular cartilage, if it's if it's relatively stable, it still has a protective effect for the knee. So no, debreeding it actually accelerates the degenerative disease. No, I, I I wouldn't debreed it. Yeah. So. There's a pretty common procedure, basically called an arthroscopic clean-out by a lot of people, but they're, they're now considered contraindicated. But that was a very common procedure up till about five years ago. I, I never I did a debris month for that reason, so I'm, yeah. I guess I was in a different field from <laughs> these, these other folks. Yeah. Um... See some foci of susceptibility uh, in the medial condyle. Wonder if this is chondroplasty. Okay, here are the coronal images. Okay, so it looks like yeah, we have some surgical yeah. trap and, there. And this is this is a patient who had arthroscopic pinning. Okay, so the, the, I don't have the. Prior images, but there was a, a loose defect, a loose uh, a fragment of cartilage here, and they came in and pinned it. Unfortunately, uh, this actually shows that the cartilage is somewhat degraded. But uh, these, this is a one Tesla scanner, and really to evaluate these things, you would need a one point five or three Tesla. Okay. Unusual to just have one um, pin. Well, they had uh, multiple ones here. If we go to oh, this I, side. See, I see now. Okay. Yeah. And that, 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 that's a child, so um, that should come out better than an adult. Yeah. All right. So we have uh, coronal and the sagittal of the knee. Looks like there's a full thickness cartilage defect of that lateral femoral condyle. Okay. So what would you want to do next? Uh, I guess look for that, <laughs> that fragment. There it is, yeah. And, uh, yeah, you want to look for the fragment, see the fragment there. Mm -hmm. So if it's really acute, uh, especially if they're young kids, uh, this still may be viable. In fact, I think there was a recent study that uh, I think... Uh, Bert Mandelbaum talked about in the lecture, I believe, or maybe it was otherwise, that if you actually look at these fragments and you then check for viable cells, large fragments like this will have viable cells in them for a long period of time. So they still get nutrients from the, uh, from the joint space. So, I, and then I think there's a lot of people talking about different ways to handle this. Uh, should you just try to take this and tack it back in place and see if it works? Or would it be better to take it out, grow cartilage from the chondrocytes of that individual, 
uh, shape it into the exact right form, and then cut back and fit it in place with basically a, a we'll talk about it in a, in a little bit, uh, where, you, where you're putting uh, a, a, an autograft uh, of articular cartilage uh, by growing the cells in a scaffold of the right size and so forth. So I think there are a lot of different technologies that are being used today, and uh, a lot of this will be sorted out, I think, in the next few years as to which ones we're going to One of the, uh, the hardest thing in this case, John, is um, getting that fragment back in place. Okay. Um, that, that is a hard thing to do. I, I remember I had a resident at at orthopedic hospital, uh, do the knee for, for me, I, uh, which I always did, uh, get them started and let them work on it. And the uh, for, uh, fellow forgot to to get an x-ray before the before the fragment was anterior, so I figured, oh, that, that's not going to be an easy one. Uh, and then uh, we opened up the knee and, uh, or the, I mean, or arthroscopically, and uh, uh, we couldn't see the fragment. It had migrated posterior. Uh -huh. uh, it took th three hours to get that sucker out oh, in a place where, where I could pin it. Right. And so, so in this case, they took that fragment, put it back in place, and there are the pins to pin it in case. That's what I would have done. Yeah. So that's pinning. The next technique, which was very popular, uh, 20 years ago, yeah, up to about 10 years ago maybe, uh, is a microfracture technique. Uh, uh, some people call it neural stimulation. In this particular case, you have a defect. You, you basically debreed it. I actually showed a, uh, images of uh, arthroscopy of this, I think, on the previous lecture. Uh, then you kind of scrape the surface of the bone, and then you put in just puncture wounds here to get clot formation and bleeding into the area of the defect, uh, as we see here, come around here, and then you can get a clot to form there. This is the video I showed before. This is at the beginning. Then you have to debreed the area of abnormality here. Uh, then you put the little puncture holes. You don't scrape it, but you just put puncture holes in. Allow, and then when you take off the tourniquet, you get bleeding in that particular area. Uh, this is called a microfracture technique. Uh, <clears throat> initially, it was thought to be good for only about a year. Then studies came out uh, 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 one to two decades ago showing that you can actually get a fibrohyaline cartilage. It's not histologically identical to regular hyaline cartilage, uh, and it can actually last for a number of years. Uh, this is microfracture, uh, uh, but uh, there have been a number of studies that have come out comparing microfracture to some of the more current techniques, which are basically uh, osteochondral grafts, and uh, the osteochondral grafts really come out to be superior in, in all of those studies. So microfracture, especially in athletes, is not something that's, that's done routinely uh, anymore. Uh, what you look for when you follow these is to see if the defect fills. And what this study showed by Grabazzi in Boston and all, uh, they didn't always fill in, in two-year follow-up. You get a poorly defined surface. You can get a lot of hyper intensity that persists, which is a poor prognostic find. And uh, you can get persistent subchondral bone marrow edema. Another technique that's used are called osteochondral plugs where you'll go off to the periphery and you'll take bone and cartilage plugs so you ream them out of viable articular cartilage. Uh, you take the area of the defect and you debreed it and then you put in uh, a mosaic of these different plugs into the area of the defect. Some people call this a mosaoplasty, uh, which we see here. These are uh, small, uh, a bunch of small osteochondria grafts to kind of fill the hole there. Uh, this was a single one here where we can see the defect. This is debrided. This is 2001. They then went in and got an osteochondral plug and filled that defect. And this is now a couple of years later where you can see the cartilage is still intact, a uh, relatively smooth peripheral surface uh, of this sealed osteochondral plug. Here's, here's basically over a number of years. 
2001, 2003, 2004, and you're starting to see breakdown of that cartilage overlying the plug here uh, uh, in 2004. So now I've seen over the years a lot of defects in these. This happens to be a large osteochondral plug here, and uh, this is uh, 9 2, uh, soon after it was put in. What you see here that this is very proud. Uh, when it's proud like this, very rapidly, that is within weeks of weight bearing, you can destroy the overlying articular cartilage. Here it is, uh, as we can see, only two months, two and a half months later, the bone has now been ground down to be uh, uh, really at the same level as the rest of the subchondral bone, but the articular cartilage is now no longer intact. So when you put these in, getting uh, uh, proper placement of the, of the graft so it's not too proud or, or, or too deep is really essential. So uh, these can be technically uh, difficult to do. Um, here's just another example where they put in multiple graphs. They're not uh, uh, placed properly. You can see they're at, at different angles. This one is very proud. And uh, you can see there's persistent bone edema, which is a very bad sign in these. And this one broke down into just a large defect. So, uh, so these have to be placed meticulously correctly for them to work. Someone with uh, anterior knee pain, we can see a big osteochondral defect here on the CT examination. Here is the MR, and uh, this is after they put in a, a graft plug in this location. So when the... Uh, uh, an old, old resident of mine, uh, Pam Bertello, who's at, at Colonel and Joe Hobbs, yep. uh, he, uh, just did, uh, he wrote a paper on the subject. Yeah, he still does a lot of these, right. So this is a study where they looked at mean survival rates over 5, 10, and 20 years for these osteochondral graphs in the American Journal of Sports Medicine in 2017. And they actually found that there was, to me, a really surprising uh, survival rates in these if they're done properly. So uh, these, and there, there are other studies now that have confirmed this, uh, so that these are, uh, uh, is a very viable way to go, and uh, especially in athletes who really need high performance, uh, this is a much better uh, technique than the microfracture that was used before. Let's see who's next. Okay, we have uh, PD fat set images. I see a chondral defect. Yes, I think we're a little maybe lateral. So this was uh, 8 30, 2004, mm -hmm. 8 29, 2005. So we're here out. What do you see here? So, yeah, some kind of subchondral hypotense signal there. Maybe there's, maybe there's an allograft. No, on, on the sagittal, um, yeah, that. Okay, so what we see here is a little bit of edema here in that notch of the knee. And here, this is not, the... not the donor site. So as John was saying, this is a donor site where they went in and they basically... Uh, I, I don't know, I, I, I guessed right. <laughs> so they... Uh, they took articular cartilage here, which is non-articular articular cartilage. So the, it's, it's not going to damage the patient from a functional standpoint. They take bone that's with just, this. Go ahead. That's just on the margin, John. Yeah. And then they actually take it out, put it in a blender, grind it up, and they paste it in the defect. And uh, this is called a paste graph by, by this particular surgeon who does this. And much to my surprise, we actually looked at outcomes over 20 years of him doing this. And the, the results of having good filling like this uh, are very high. I forgot exactly what the numbers were. But uh, uh, that's something that, that uh, actually 
is surprising to me uh, that it, both functional outcomes and imaging outcomes were actually quite good in the vast majority of these. So that's called a pace graph technique. So that includes a bit of bone as well. Bone and yeah, hard gets ground up together. Yeah. Yeah, it all gets ground up together and they kind of paste it in so you have bone, bone and cartilage. Uh, the, so it's a little bit different from some of the more advanced techniques that we're going to talk about in a minute that we've already talked about a little bit before, where you actually put in anatomic bone and cartilage not ground together. Uh, and, and then this is this is another pace graph set. But anyway, I... Uh, okay, and... Here we can see another osteochondral defect here, 4 2012. And uh, here's an osteochondral plug, and uh, it looks much better. Oh, I'm sorry, this was another pace graft. So this was a defect here, and we can see a large osteochondral defect. This was another pace graft, uh, where you also have patellar disease, but Put the pace graft in, and uh, he actually had a very good, very good outcome. This is just another example. I won't go through too many of these. Then we go to the next technique where we're starting to get into cell based repair. This is uh, more the state of the art uh, now, <clears throat> but actually, this is an older technique. Uh, this was a two stage technique. For the first stage, you go in and debreed the area, you get the patient's cartilage. You take the uh, samples of the cartilage out. You grow the chondrocytes uh, in in vitro uh, in, a, in a culture. Uh, then you put in a scaffold. It can be collagen. It can be a lot of different things. You then put the patient's uh, chondrocytes uh, into the scaffold, and, and and it grows. And then you then go in a second procedure. You go back into the patient, you cut just to the proper size to fit in where the defect is, and then you implant it um, and kind of sew it into place, and you put in, uh, uh, you put in a little uh, 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 periosteal graft overlying it to, uh, to hold it in place. And uh, uh, this is called chondrocyte transplantation. Uh, you can do the patient's own uh, cells, you can also buy uh, grafts in, from cadaver donors, uh, or allografts, uh, and do a, a similar sort of thing. So the, this is just an example uh, of a case that was had a chondrocyte transplantation. I see a little bit of susceptibility or effect in the area of the, of the study. And then here is just a, a this is a, another defect where. Uh, they they did uh, a graft uh, back on 4-16-2008, and here we can see the, the abnormal bone. It's not good to have this kind of edema. Usually with successful ones, the edema goes away. We can see this is the area of the graft, and one of the complications you can get, this is the normal uh, uh, articular cartilage. Notice the graft is thicker than the regular articular cartilage, so this graft is proud. And one of the things you occasionally have to do, it will overgrow, and you have to go in and you have to uh, uh, ream it down so that it's a proper thickness uh, if it grows over time. This is called autologous cell implantation. Well, this, our, this is our arthritic knee already. Yeah, so this is right. I, I don't expect this here. I wouldn't think that this patient is going to be very happy down the road. Yeah. Uh, some of these were a little bit more aggressive in the past where they were trying to get patients so they were older before they had total knees, but now total knees last a lot longer than they did before. So uh, a lot of these patients, uh, like that patient, would probably be better just to go to a, either a uni or a total knee replacement now, even if they're younger. And they're being done much earlier than uh, when I started orthopedics uh, and we started doing these, um, we wouldn't operate on anybody under the age of 60, 65 um, with a total or, or a partial replacement. Uh, now it's uh, 
40, 40 to 50. Um, some people are doing them. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's uh, been a big change cool. in technology. So we have a 27 year old post op follow up, and then it looks like there's a chondral defect in that medial femoral condyle. Maybe a flap. And... Yeah, it's different signal intensity uh, right in through there. And, but here you can see it looks actually pretty good. The surface looks pretty much intact. A little bit of bony abnormal signal, a little bit of inhomogeneity in the signal. And this is called a de novo cartilage implant. It's uh, basically uh, 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 an implant that, that you put in from an allograft from uh, other cells. And uh, uh, these can work well. Uh, some of these techniques are not FDA approved in the US. It's one of the reasons why you occasionally hear about athletes going to uh, Australia or Europe for surgery in order to get some of these newer techniques that are not yet FDA approved. Uh, one of the problems uh, that I don't think we talked about is that um, quite a few of these knees are not, um, don't just have a defect they also have a problem with uh, ligaments and uh, stability right and uh, so uh, it's not only one thing you have to deal with but multiple things yeah so pre-op we here we see a large defect in the articular cartilage uh, this is called a macy uh, technique you basically go and take a biopsy uh, kind of process, uh, extract the chondrocytes, uh, grow them in, in vitro, and then you, you make a sheet and cut it out and, and implant the, uh, the sheet of chondrocytes. And there you can see the defect. Uh, and then here, this is uh, afterwards here. Patient without symptoms, this is a little bit concerning to me because you've got a subchondral osteophyte there. And I really don't see a good full thickness uh, uh, cartilage overlying this particular area. So from an imaging standpoint, it looks to me like there really isn't good cartilage uh, overlying this. But, but uh, this is another technique. Uh, and there have been a, been a lot of studies that are going in to, to, to look at uh, what's called the Macy type grafts. So, there are a bunch of different techniques, and I think right now they're really all uh, really much involved in looking at all, all of these different techniques and whether it's going to sort out and uh, which ones really are actually going to be uh, winners going forward. So basically looking at articular cartilage, we've talked about structure, we've talked about the pathophysiology of cartilage, talk about biochemical imaging, anatomic imaging, and treatment, there are a lot of different treatments right now, but certainly what seems to be winning now that wasn't uh, a number of years ago when we first started looking at articular cartilage really are uh, osteochondral grafts, of which there, there are many different techniques now. And most people now are trying to go to uh, one-step techniques where you don't have to go back in on a, on a second surgery. And I, I think there's a just a lot of development in this area. So I think it's gonna be substantially better in five to 10 years, and we'll know a lot more. Thank you, okay. And the main problem is that you have to wait a long time to find out if, you're, if, the, if, if it's gonna work or not. Yeah, wow, well, yeah. All righty, well, everybody have a good evening. And uh, we'll start a new topic on uh, Thursday. Sounds good. Have a good afternoon, and we'll see you guys on Thursday. Thanks, John.